This is Cerebral Cinema. Movies of the Mind. Cerebral Cinema and the WON Radio Network present to you Superwoman. Yes, Superwoman, the dynamic crime fighter. Superwoman, the champion of justice. Superwoman, who in truth is mild-mannered Chicago news reporter Emily Nesbacher. A Rocky Jordan Show. And I'm Rocky Jordan. We take you now to Cairo and the Cafe Tambourine for a world of adventure with Rocky Jordan. It started with a timid tapping on the door to my office. When I said come in, the door opened, and standing framed in the archway was a skinny guy with high cheekbones and a hawk-like nose. My name's Harry Tadoma. As you see by the gate I carry, I am a merchant of birth. Uh-huh. I see by the look in your eye, I'm your target for tonight. Ah, you are a man of vision. These love birds are yours, Mr. Jordan, for the insignificant sum of 30 piastres. Sorry, Solomon, I'm not the market. The 30 piastres includes the case. Uh-uh. Put a six-month supply of bird food. I'm sorry, Solomon, I told you I didn't want them. But in all honesty, Effendi, I cannot allow you to bypass such a bargain. Get out of here. 25 piastres, and I will clean the case. Let go my sleeve, him she? What was that? I'm going to shot in the alley. Dead! At the alley's end, a woman with a gun. At the end of the alley, some 50 feet away, stood a girl in a white dress, bare at the shoulders, her profile silhouetted in the hazy light of a street lamp. She was using both hands to aim an oversized revolver at a cringing figure. Two more shots came, and the figure of the man rolled into the gutter. The girl threw a shot at the street lamp, shattering it, and started to run. By the time I got to the spot of shooting, she, whoever she was, had completely vanished into the Cairo night. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with tourists, camel drivers, women, chiefs, forgotten men down on their luck, the lonely and the lost. For this is Cairo, gateway to the ancient east where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's Rocky Jordan story, The Word of a Bishop. Well, it didn't take long for the Cairo curious to swarm around the place like a bunch of summer flies. I put in a call to Captain Sam Sabaya, Cairo police, and soon he and Sergeant Greco made their appearance. Now, Jordan, what do you know of this? Well, oh, very little, Sam. I was in my office having a verbal bout with a seller of birds named Solomon. He's uh, around here someplace. We heard a shot, looked out my back door, and saw a woman pour a couple of bullets into this guy. Before I could do anything, she was gone. Mm-hmm. The size of the wound, I assume, a large caliber pistol was used. It is rather unusual for a woman. You know this man? Never seen him before. Well, let me see the identification of his person. No passport, no billfold, apparently no identification of any sort. Now, are there any of you here who can inform me of the identity of the dead man? Well, come, come, speak up. Do any of you know him? I do, Captain. Who, who speaks? Oh, that girl. The name of the dead man, Captain, is Robert Deidre. My husband and I have just consummated a business deal with him. I believe I know why he was killed. I see. Uh, Jordan, may we use the quiet of your office to go into this matter more fully? Sure, Sam. Come on. Uh, Captain, you might send a messenger to the bar of the hotel to meet him the second up the street. My husband's there, Ralph Keene. Yeah. He knows as much, Mr. Deidre, as I do. As you say, Mrs. King, I wish to get to the bottom of this killing as quickly as possible. Her name was Amy Ruth King, an American citizen, Dallas born and bred, she said. She was tall and thin with fair skin and green eyes. 
But the most striking feature about her was her hair, a natural copper. She said it gave her her nickname, Copper. Copper King. Well, in my office, the three of us waited, passing a little small talk, until Greco ushered in a six-foot-two, tan, wiry Texas millionaire, sporting a broad-brimmed Stetson and high-heeled boots. What's all the excitement? There's a crowd in the street. Mr. And Dietrich's been killed, right? Killed? What in the world? Oh, uh, Mr. Keene, I am Captain Sabaya of the Cairo Police. This is Mr. Jordan, who is the owner of this cafe. You were kind enough to allow us to lose it. Oh, yes, uh, 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 your wife tells me you and she have just consummated a business deal with Mr. Dietra. Why, uh, yes, it's not more than 20 minutes ago in the hotel. $50,000 worth of business. You see, I bought some Arabian horses from him from my ranch in Texas. A cash deal, Mr. King? Why, yes, Mr. Jordan. Mr. Deidre wanted it that way. He was an agent for some sheik or other who wanted American dollars. Now, there's your motive, Sam. Robbery. The girl who shot Deidre must have known he was carrying the money, robbed him, and killed him. You say it was a girl? Well, dog go. Did you see her, Mr. Jordan? Uh-huh. Well, then you'll be able to identify her. Captain Sabine. Well, no, I didn't see her that well. Oh, that's too bad. Rob, Mrs. Jordan's an American from St. Louis. You tell me all about it while we were waiting for you. Don't you think we ought to invite him to have dinner with us before we leave town? Well, Amy, Ruth, oh, that's that fun. We could talk about home. I'm homesick, all right. Uh, Mr. Keene, who knew you were consummating your business with Mr. Dieter tonight at the hotel? Well, that's mighty hard to say, Captain. Amy, Ruth, and I haven't said anything to anyone, but I don't know who Mr. Dieter told. <laughs> well, I will detain you no longer, but I shall get in touch with you in the morning. Why, sure, Captain. We'll be mighty happy to give you any help we can. Goodbye, and bye, Mr. Jordan. You come along, Amy, Ruth. Bye, Mr. Jordan. Remember, we'll meet again. Well, find the woman, Jordan. That seems to be my job. What if it's going to be as easy as it sounds? Sam left. The next morning at 8 o'clock, my phone rang. It was Sabai again. He wanted to see me in his office right away, and I could tell by his tone something had happened. I made it over there as soon as I could. Jordan, I want you to meet someone. Uh, would you be kind enough to introduce yourself to Mr. Jordan, sir? Uh, most certainly, Captain. My name, Mr. Jordan, is George Ronald Heatherbrook. As you can see, I'm a minister. Actually, I'm a bishop. And my home is in Manchester, England. I happen to... That he was a man of the church. The reverse collar he wore told me before he even spoke. His hair was white, his face ruddy, and he wore a lightweight, soft gray suit with a black vest. It was easy to see he was a man of great self-assurance. To Jordan, I want you to tell Bishop Heatherbrook what you told me last night about the Deidre killing. Well, a bird seller and I were in my office when we heard a shot. We looked out the back door and saw it. A girl in a white off-the-shoulder dress fired two shots into Deidre and then escaped. Mm. Now, Bishop Heatherbrook, would you be good enough to tell Mr. Jordan what you told me about the Deidre killing? Certainly. I was sitting by the window of the boarding house across the street. I heard the first shot and looked out the window to see what was going on. I, I saw the person fire two shots, as you say, and I saw Mr. Deidre collapse. Then I saw the person flee. Well, that jives him. That's exactly... One moment, Jordan. Continue. The person who shot Mr. Deidre was not wearing a white off the shoulder dress. Actually, the person was wearing a dark coat with dark trousers. And the person was not a girl at all, Mr. Jordan. It was a, a man. Man? What is this? Thank you very much, Bishop Heatherbrook. That will be all for the moment. Uh, you have my address if you wish to speak to me further. Goodbye, Captain. Goodbye, Mr. Jordan. Pleasure to have met you. What's going on, Sam? A question I might do well to ask you. Jordan, we have had many dealings together and many differences. But I have never known you to willfully lie to me. I didn't lie. You said a woman killed Deidre. The bishop said a man. Are you then telling me it is Bishop Heatherbrook who is lying? I'm just telling him what I saw. Then you are telling me the bishop is lying. An accusation I find difficult to believe and one 
you will find difficult to substantiate. I wonder. What do you know about Hellebuck? He might not be what he says he is. I have discussed the situation with the officials of the British Embassy, and I have no doubt Bishop Hellebuck is all that he says he is, a man of the church. Jordan, I do not wish our friendship to dissolve over this matter. I got someone to back up my story, Sam. Solomon, the bird merchant, saw what I saw. Oh, yes. We have mentioned him before, but I have not seen him as yet. All right, I'll find him for you and dump him right in your lap. I suggest you do a little more digging on Bishop Hedderbrook, or whoever he is. Take it from me, things aren't as they seem. <laughs> Sam was right about one thing. There was a lie in it someplace. Deidre wasn't killed by both a man and a woman firing the same gun. Well, Solomon could substantiate my story, so I started into the Cairo night to find him. I spent hours at it, checking beggars, the wholesale bird market, and the sand device at Felic Bazaar. That's when I spotted a figure, slight of bill, pale features, walking some paces behind me. A tail job. I ducked into a doorway, waited for him to come by. All right, Shadow, turn around. Please, Mr. Yeah. Jordan, you're wrinkling my suit. I'll wrinkle more than that if you don't start saying a few things. My name is Ethic, sir. It has come to my attention that you are searching for men named Solomon, a merchant of birth. That's not news. Now tell me something I don't know. Patience, Mr. Jordan. I find it unwise to talk without previously arranging the remuneration. I've offered five pounds for Solomon's address. Then perhaps I do not wish to speak for so small as some. I'm not in the mood for gauge. Now, come on, where does Solomon live? Oh, I will not tell. I will not know. Uh -huh. oh, Sixteen Sharia Mutah. There you lie with a straight face, but you better try again. I tell you, Mr. Jones, that is the place. No, oh, my arm, you're hurting it. Oh, my. Seven thirty-five on the Sharia El Sharia. Yes, a room behind the chicken market. Well, okay. Yeah, another five pounds. Five pounds? <clears throat> Keep your five pounds. My payment will come in another way. Essex turned on a sour scowl, then slink away and lost himself in the night. I caught a cab and made it to the chicken market on Sharia El Shamir. The room behind it was easy to find. No lights came from inside. Wrapped on the door. No answer came, so I pushed at it. The door swung open. Light from the street lamp came to the room. Solomon's room, all right. Bird cage in the corner. Two lovebirds, first close to each other, cooing away. Told me as much. What was more interesting was the figure on the bed. My corroborating witness, Solomon, the merchant of birds. He was dead. <laughs> The bird seller who could prove to Sabaya that my version of the Deidre killing wasn't a lie was dead. So I was right back where I started from. It was still Bishop Heatherbrook's word against mine. I threw a cloth over the dead Solomon and stepped into the street again to find a public phone to call Sabaya. I didn't have to. A moment later, a large official limousine turned the corner and pulled to a stop right in front of me. Captain Sam Sabaya climbed out of the back seat. Oh, what is this, Sam? Celebrity? I was just going to call you. About the death of Solomon the Seller of Birds, no doubt. How do you know? I have been informed of the matter already by the man who sits in the back seat of my limousine. How do you do, Mr. George? We meet again. Ah, Bishop Heatherbrook. Yes, you remember my name. I'm flattered. I got a reason to. How do you know Solomon was dead? Why, I presume the same way you did, Mr. Jordan. I saw him. So did the man who killed him. Jordan, watch your towel. Oh, it's all right, Captain. Mr. Jordan meant no offense. He was simply stating what is true. What are you doing here in the first place? Jordan, the bishop does not have to answer your question. But I don't mind at all, Captain Zavaya. Then you will excuse me. The sergeant and I have work to do in Solomon's room. Come along, Tanya. Uh, Mr. Jordan, I came here even as you did to speak to Solomon. I had said that it was a man... Who killed Mr. Deidre, and you had said it was a woman. Well, we could not both be right. I wish to see if Solomon would really have substantiated your story. Now, I guess we won't know, will we? I guess not. 
All of which still makes me wonder why you said it was a man when I know it was a woman. And I wonder no less, Mr. Jordan, why you said it was a woman when I know it was a man. Uh, I, I can see you trust yourself more than you do me. It's quite natural, of course. I wonder if you believe I am who I say I am. People have passed themselves off as other people. Well, the British Embassy has vouched for me. The police officials in Manchester, England, will vouch for me, too. So will His Eminence, the Reverend Joseph Wadey of the Coptic Church in Alexandria. Formidable array of people on my side. Uh, how can you challenge them at all? You're making it awfully tough. There's one thing I can do. What is that? Find the girl who killed Deidre. When I left the bishop, I headed toward my end of town, but all the while I sat in the back of a taxi, my mind was thinking of Amy Ruth Keene, Copper Keene, and the things she had said in my office. I told the cabbie to drop me off at the Hotel Ramides II and went up to the desk clerk. Oh, uh, Keene's room, please. Which one is it? Mr. Keene or Mrs. Keene? Yes, sir. They have separate suites. Mr. Keene is in 212. Mrs. Keene is 211. Thanks. A little while later, I stood in front of 211, Mrs. Keene's suite. A funny thing struck me. 211 and 212 were across the hall from each other. An odd arrangement for a married couple. Now, the buzzer brought the door open in a moment. An elderly lady who said she was Amy Ruth's Aunt Stella let me in. I told her what I wanted. She called Copper and left the two of us alone to talk. Well, Rocky. Mrs. Keene. They call me Copper, Rocky. It's much more intimate. Now, let's leave it, Mrs. Keene. For a while, at least. Why do you look so serious? I'm in a little blind. An English bishop named Heatherbrook. Oh, yes, I know about it. Captain Tobias, no Ralph. A girl killed Deidre. That's what I saw. Did you? Why tell me about it? I don't know for sure. But I'd like to find the girl who did it. You certainly don't think it was me, Rocky. Mrs. Keene, Deidre was killed because of the $60,000 he carried on his person. Whoever killed him had to be someone who knew he had the money. And I certainly knew that. It also had to be someone who would kill $60,000. Well? Why should the life of a millionaire kill her? What would be a small sum to her? Well, now, there you have said it. I didn't kill Miss Deidre. I feel bad but suppose the wife of the millionaire weren't getting along too well. Had separate apartments, should we say. Suppose the marriage was on the verge of breaking up. Suppose the state of Texas, USA, or wherever they live, had no community property law. Or suppose the wife needed a large sum of money in a hurry for some reason or other. Couldn't get it from her husband. You do think I'll kill Mr. Deidre, darling. This is shocking. You used to murder my man, I hardly know. Let you me know, you put your mind at ease. Come with me. Just into the next room. I want to show you something. My purse. Here it is. A letter of credit from the Texas State Bank of Dallas. If you read it carefully, you'll see it's made out to Miss Amy Routine. That's me. And you'll also realize it isn't Ralph who's a millionaire. It means the millionaire. I don't get it. Ralph and I aren't now. He's the foreman of my ranch. I brought him here with me and Aunt Stella. Had him pose as my husband. Had him make the deal to buy the Arabian horses I wanted. Why? Because I'd heard an Arab sheep doesn't like to do business with a woman. The man can get a better deal. Let's see. Now, Rocky, you better start calling me copper and take me out. I'll be mad at you for thinking you all thoughts about me. Well, she was dressed in 15 minutes and we started to make the rounds, even though I wasn't in a festive mood. El Kami's Club, the House of Pharaoh, a little Paris club. Copper liked them all. At one o'clock, we were sitting at a corner table in the exclusive key club. Sort of rendezvous for visiting dignitaries from foreign lands. Copper liked that place, too. Well, I must say, Rocky, I couldn't have picked a better guy. But I sure could have picked a gay one. Hmm? Oh, sorry, Copper. Just been thinking about something else. Ah, uh-huh. like you have been all evening. The deeds were killing, isn't it? That's the bishop that bothers me, I guess. I'll let it go. I'll try to... 
That's the way to team, Monroe. Introducing the internationally famous dance team of Monroe and the police. All your face. <laughs> Andro, a tall, slim man in a dark cutaway. De Philippe, a graceful brunette, dark eyes with white evening out. They went into their act, and they were good, spinning lively in big spotlight. Then something struck me. It struck copper, too, at the same time. Look, Rocky, with the spotlight on him, it's like an electric sign, flashing on and off. First you see the man, then the girl. The man, and then the girl. Yeah, come on, copper, let's get out of here. What's the doctor? Come on, we haven't got time to talk. I got something to do. Drop you off at your hotel and talk to you tomorrow. Oh, but I don't understand. I don't exactly understand myself. But I hope to before the night's out. I dropped Copper off at a room at Hotel Remedies the second, walked down to the lobby, and found a phone. A moment later, I had awakened the good Bishop Heatherbrook. Hello? Hello? Uh, Bishop Heatherbrook, Jordan. Answer right. one question for me. Who told you where to find Solomon? Well, let's see. Oh, a slight, very pale-faced young man. I can't remember his name. Essex? Uh, yes, that's it. Uh, we met in the lobby of the hotel Remedy the second. I believe he has a room there. Well, he couldn't have picked a better place. I'm there already. Thanks, Bishop Ellerbrook. <laughs> Sleepy desk clerk gave me Essex's room number. Knock on the door, brought no answer, but a sleepier elevator man loaned me his pass key. Inside Essex room, I wasted no time. I started with the bureau drawers. There was nothing there but a lot of soiled clothes. Next came the desk by the corner window. Nothing there but hotel stationery. Then came the closets. A locked suitcase looked promising. I pried it open and looked inside. Lying right on top was a photograph of Essex himself. A theatrical photograph of Essex in dance costume. One look at the costume told me the answer. Both Bishop Heatherbrook and myself told true stories of the Deidre killing. Well, the answer to the strange affair was in Essex's suitcase. An answer which showed that both Bishop Heatherbrook and I had told true stories. A photograph of Essex in theatrical dress. A dance costume, half man, half woman. It was a weird kind of act. I remembered seeing one like it many years ago in a nightclub in Marseille. I stuffed the photo into my pocket and prepared to go to Sam. This, Mr. Jordan. I do not wish you to leave so soon. Walk toward it was Essex standing with his back to the door. He gave his hand. Ah, you have found the secret then? If you dig deeper into that suitcase, you will find the costume itself. I won't need it, Essex. This photo will be fine. How can you talk so arrogantly? After all, I have begun. Same one that killed Deidre and Solomon, huh? The very same. A fairly neat trick, Essex. Killing costume, half man, half woman. In the night, it confused the witnesses. They the job out of the police. What you say? Well, Sam would have worked it out. He'd figure just like I am now. You learned it at home. How so? You were all dressed up in that outfit of yours, hiding up the street someplace from the Hotel Remedies the second, waiting for Peter. But you had to know his time to come by, and he was carrying the money. Now, who'd know that? Peter himself, Aunt Ruth Keene, and Ralph. Deidre wasn't going to tell anybody. It would be a dangerous thing for him to advertise. Amy Ruth had no interest in 60000 Lipstick money for her. So it was Ralph who got a taste of high living and life. $60,000 would be a good thing. He did your... What was the split, Essex? How much did you get for killing? Enough, Mr. George. Come on, tell me. I'm interested in knowing the going rates for death. Yes, my good friend. We'll be very cheap in mm-hmm. here. In fact, I plan on doing it for nothing. As he was the kind of like to kill slowly, but standing there with his back to the door, he waited too long. The door flung open suddenly and caught Essex right down the center of his back. The Joe shoved him forward, his gun went off into the floor. I stepped forward, drew a heavy right into the side of his face. He sprawled floor, his gun fell free, and I picked it up. That's when I looked up. Standing in the doorway, unruffled and turned all, was Bishop Heatherbrook himself. Why isn't coming here? Was I not, Mr. Jordan? Well, 
Me, you were. Oh, here, take the gun. Keep an eye on Essek. Very good. Well, I must say, everything has happened to me since I've come to Cairo. You might also put in a call to Sabaya. Where are you going, Mr. Gold? A little unfinished business with a Texan named Ralph. I took the stairs two at a time, and a moment later was rapping in the room. Sleepy Ralph opened and was a little annoyed that I woke him up. He was more annoyed when I told him what had happened. But he didn't put up much of a fight. The cowboy was caught with his boots off. More coffee for you, Bishop? Oh, no, thank you, Captain. I'm afraid I'm not quite man enough to drink much of this strong Egyptian brew. <laughs> Gets to me, That's too, Bishop. Well, the deeper affair is disposed of. Essex and Ralph will, of course, pay for their crimes, and Miss Key will go back to her state of fix. I don't mind telling you, I'm quite glad the matter is ending. And so am I, sir. Let me spinning for a while. I don't mind admitting that I, too, was somewhat confused. Well, you know something, Bishop? You were right, and I was wrong. How so? A man did kill me. Yes, sir. Well, let us see. You see, young man, never dispute. The world of the bishop. Rocky Jordan is a weekly presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Cerebral Cinema hopes you have enjoyed this movie of the mind.